My son worked in Puerto Rico in the summer of 2016 as a national park intern. At the end of that summer, we visited him there. The island was a mix of incredible beauty and incredible poverty. We spoke with some of those who lived there that said because of certain economic changes over the last several years that the small island nation was struggling financially. Then Hurricane Maria hit this past week. The financially struggling island was not prepared for the devastation that was visited upon it. My son has yet to hear from any of the friends he made while living there. They have no power, and a cell phone service is spotty at best. On the United Nations webpage on water and climate change, the first sentence reads, water is the primary medium through which we will feel the effects of climate change. When I think about water and climate change, I often think about drought, because water scarcity is one of the effects of a warming planet. But the last several weeks have shown us that it is not simply water scarcity, but also an overabundance of water that is one of the effects of climate change. As the Earth warms, more and more of the water on Earth is absorbed into the atmosphere, creating the category four and five hurricanes that we have witnessed in the past several weeks that have nearly destroyed several islands in the Caribbean and crippled Houston. I read in an article last week that we must stop calling these storms natural disasters. We, humans, did this. Almost 30 years ago, in 1988, James Hansen, a leading climate scientist, warned in a hearing before Congress that it was 99% certain that the warming trend being observed at the time was not a natural variation but was caused by the buildup of carbon dioxide and other artificial gases in the atmosphere. In 1992, leaders from all over the world came together in Rio de Janeiro for the first Earth Summit to create an agenda that would work toward increasing environmental sustainability in the coming decades. But the will to change our carbon emissions did not materialize. The push for economic globalization occurred around the same time, so that the resulting move to create ever more disposable consumer goods in order to keep feeding unsustainable global economic growth exacerbated rather than alleviated carbon emissions. George Manbiot in The Guardian writes, Environmental destruction is not a byproduct of this system. It is a necessary element. Bill McKibben called his environmental organization 350.org because 350 parts per million atmospheric carbon was considered the level beyond which unpredictable effects in climate might occur. In January of this year, Nicholas Jones wrote for Yale's Environment 360, in 2014, the atmosphere stayed above 400 parts per million for the whole month of April. By 2015, the annual average was above 400 parts per million. And in September 2016, the usual annual low skimmed above 400 parts per million for the first time, keeping air concentrations above that symbolic red line all year. The current administration's response is to remove the United States from the Paris Agreement and the new EPA director to say that it is insensitive to people suffering from the effects of hurricanes to bring up climate change. In this year's relentless hurricane season, the new normal? And if so, what does hope look like? What is the religious response 
How and where do we find meaning in this? The truthful answer to this is, I don't know. This answer comes from years of religious environmental activism. Before I came to Divinity School, I did intercongregational organizing around climate change. I participated in environmental lobbying for religious leaders on Earth Day Lobby Day at my state capitol. I have been a founding member and organizer of two different interfaith environmental groups, both of which do extraordinary work raising awareness on climate change. I have participated in marches and rallies. I helped lead groups to raise awareness on fracking. And when New York banned fracking, I was elated. I live in an intentional community where pioneering and modeling different, more sustainable ways of living on this planet is our primary goal. I helped start a small high school which has sustainability embedded in its entire curriculum. And I still think, I don't know. Because when I step out of that world and notice that even with all the work I and all the people I have worked with over the last decade have been doing, the planet is still warming that we are facing an environmental crisis, that hurricanes are getting worse, that the Southwest and the Pacific Northwest are drying out and catching fire. One answer, one piece of hope that is part of the dominant narrative is that with the help of technological ingenuity, we will create a renewable energy infrastructure that will usher in a new green economy and we will lower our carbon emissions. Then we can continue to live just as we have been living, and we will not have to question the other ways in which our frenzied and consumptive lifestyles are destroying the very infrastructure that makes life possible. This, for me, is the scariest kind of hope. Ronald Wright, in his book, A Short History of Progress, describes Ice Age hunters in a way that is equally appropriate to humans in the current age. We have evolved toward a certain level of intelligence, clever but seldom wise. And then a voice comes to me, has been coming to me, that says, stop. I literally got a fortune cookie last week that said, live in this moment. Stop thinking that the economic system in which we are embedded will be the avenue through which we might somehow stop the destruction. Destruction is the very nature of that system. Stop thinking that renewable energy or some as yet untried technological fix like geoengineering is the best hope. I have been sitting next to Spy Pond in Arlington a lot lately. I go there in the late afternoons to sit and read my homework until the sun goes down and it gets too dark. I go there to think. Something is leading me toward another answer. It goes something like this. You're running on a treadmill to disaster. You don't have to hurry up and change the world. You need to slow down. You need to imagine something different. Imagining something different is not something I will do on my own. Imagining something different requires collective imagination. Imagining something different means that we begin to listen and become attuned to something other than the dominant narrative. Imagining something different requires wisdom as well as cleverness. Amen. <laughs>